about people dying and COVID ravaging the world and, and the, you know, the horrors of the disease, but just from a sort of a phenomenological perspective, if you will, just the visceral experiential sense of walking in San Francisco, it was uh, so, uh, it was like a De Chirico painting. You know, it had this surreal, deserted quality. Uh, I had it all to myself, I felt like, because, you know, I was wandering around the streets and I had a personal reason for this as well. I had just had one of my two already replaced knees re-replaced. I just barely got in the, under the wire of elective surgery because as you remember, may remember, London Breed uh, pulled the plug on all elective surgeries. So I was able to get it and I had just gotten home and was starting to wander a little further every day. So I had this kind of euphoric sense of convalescence as well as uh, seeing the city with completely new eyes. And when you're convalescing, you tend to see things with new eyes anyway. So it was, and I, as I wrote in the introduction to the book, I feel like it, in a way it actually brought out something deeply essential about San Francisco, or at least the way that I experience San Francisco a lot, which is very spatially and very topographically as an as a incredible physical place. And that physical placeness, the hills, the bay, the extraordinary light, the sky, uh, all of that just seemed to be heightened by the fact that suddenly there were no people there. Whereas if you were in New York, it would be equally jarring, but it would actually feel much, feel more dissonant to the nature of New York City, which is like a human hive. And San Francisco feels more to me, in, in a certain way, it felt like a stage set, a really sublime stage set, which is often the way I feel about San Francisco. And sometimes it's nice to think of it that way. <laughs> but yeah, so it was, a, it was really a high, um, with tempered, of course, with this, the, the knowledge that you know, this was a really terrible event but also the fact that people were staying in and they weren't going out or, and they were like, you know, not spreading the disease gave a really great feeling about the community of San Francisco and how we were, you know, working together to prevent this disease from, you know, killing us all. Do, do you remember any, was there any particular thing or things that you recall that you kind of saw that like you had never seen before? Yeah, I mean, it was just mundane things. It would be like, you know, I live in North Beach on Telegraph Hill, and I'd walk down to Washington Square, I think the first day I walked down, and there was, um, there was nobody, you know, just literally no one there. Uh, you know, it absolutely, just go look down Columbus Avenue, no traffic. Um, these are just, you know, profoundly disorienting things. It wasn't, there, beyond that, I can't really remember specific things. Uh, obviously, every po possible public thing that you would ever have done before was suddenly completely abandoned. For, mm -hmm. And then gradually, uh, people began to ca come back, and that's when I began to have to check myself because I began to get resentful of people that were profaning <laughs> my city. It was like, okay, you're, you're, you've gone too far now. You've gone off the deep end. You know, it's everybody else's city too. <laughs> Paul, what, what was your experience uh, of, of the pandemic and seeing the city in a, a very different way? Well, the, you know, I can relate to the stage set part of it. Um, but interestingly, with my series All Over Coffee, I'd, I'd always taken people and cars out of my drawings. So there was this weird sense of, you know, what have I done? <laughs> um, and is this really the world that I wanted? And I realized, you know, it's it's in the same way that, you know, you're like, the people come back. You're like, ah, oh, do I really want them back? Um, you know, it was nice to take everything out uh, to, for the peacefulness of the drawings. But then when the city bec had that peacefulness, it, it wasn't it wasn't so enjoyable. Um, but, you know, you asked Gary what stuck out for him, what he saw. And for me, what I saw was uh, everything being boarded up. And that sense that not only were the people not inhabiting the streets, uh, or even playing in that on that stage set, but now they were those buildings were no longer available to us. You know, to have the the windows boarded. And, you know, you dro drove through uh, Union Square in those early days, and it was just like, you know, construction van after truck, and just people pulling out sheets of plywood and, and tacking them up. And so it had a, a really sort of um, negative, like, what is going on? This is going wrong, type of feeling, and. We had done, you know, we'd done pretty much all the work before COVID. You know, we landed the book deal, and it was the last minute that we decided to do a piece. 
you know, because Gary was writing the introduction, and I said, well, let's do a, a companion drawing with it as well. And I think that the what's really interesting about that is here's this book that talks about San Francisco history, but we were able to give it a momentary context, which then over time, in years, will in itself be a, a historical artifact. I mean, not just the, the writing about it, but then a drawing of the city that's boarded up at the time. So how was um, how did the process work in doing this book? Like, how did how did you guys work together? Did you actually physically go around together, or what what did that look like? Well, we did. We did a handful of scouting trips where we got ourselves into a fair amount of trouble, mostly because we would sneak into places um, like under fences and and construction sites, and uh, we we got escorted off of one site. Um, but what's what's really I think the the most fun part of it for me is that I realize that I have a way of looking at the city and there's the things that I'm drawn to visually and and uh, and you know I'll, you can correct me but I think I'm, I'm speaking for you when I say you had have your way of looking at the city and, and the things that you know but um, when we were driving around together I would say oh that's really interesting to me or Gary would say oh there's a story behind that and suddenly I would look at a location or a building or or any site and see it a little differently because of the historical aspect and then vice versa. And so I feel like, at least for myself, Gary really opened up my, I, I got to see more of San Francisco that was always before me, but I, he, he sort of tuned a new part of my vision. Yeah, well one, one of the things I really appreciate about the book is that you know, I've lived in the city on and off for a long time and, and uh, certainly in neighborhoods that I lived in, like Telegraph Hill, for example, you know, you kind of think you know the neighborhood, but then you learn things like, I didn't know that those cliffs had been created by blasting for quarrying. Like that was like, wow, that was quite a revelation. And and be, because I lived near there, I was particularly curious of the, the story about uh, Calhoun Terrace, because uh, I live quite close there. So I was intrigued with that. And maybe that's one, if you could just talk a little bit about like, the history of that funny little stub of a street up there and, and how it kind of represented a certain era of San Francisco. Yeah, it's, it's really one of the great streets in San Francisco for those of you that know Telegraph Hill. If you go up Union Street uh, going east to the, you know, just below the summit of, of uh, uh, where Court Tower is, uh, you crest the hill, you drop down half a block and there's this remarkable street called Calhoun Terrace, and um, it really is the ultimate balcony overlooking the bay. Just be, there's this uh, vir virtually vertical cliff uh, that it looks over, and it's a split level street. That's why it's called Calhoun Terrace. There's an upper part and a lower part, and it was actually created uh, <clears throat> by these two rogue quarrymen, the Gray Brothers. Uh, who were the two most disreputable businessmen uh, in the history of San Francisco, which is a pretty large claim. And, <laughs> but, uh, and, and one of them came to his karmically deserved rewards when an aggrieved, impoverished Italian worker whose starving pregnant uh, wife didn't have any food because the Gray brothers would not pay him, uh, shot one of the Gray brothers dead in his quarry at uh, 29th, uh, over by Noe, you know, and, and that over by the uh, the, the steep uh, the dog park over there. But but they would simply they were politically connected. Uh, it was late 19th uh, century. It was a very corrupt time. The supervisors were all paid off or turned a blind eye because of their social connections, and they were instructed not to blast. But they would blithely set off enormous charges of dynamite for their quarrying business, sending houses plunging over cliffs. I mean, it's, it's impossible to believe what they did. Amazingly, no one was ever killed, but people were injured and their houses were knocked down. And they would have the most absurd excuses. My favorite is that once, uh, during on 4th of July, they used the cannon fire in the Presidio, which is only uh, you know five miles away, as a cover for their blasting. And then when called on it, they said, oh no, that was the, the gun, gun, gun fire in the, in the Presidio. Uh, but they were, uh, they, because of the blasting they did, uh, that eastern side of Telegraph Hill, uh, if any of you have ever wondered, gee, if you're driving up Sansom Street and you look up, it's like, man, that's a steep cliff. Well, that is not a cliff found in nature. That was a cliff created by the Gray Brothers. And actually that 
a lot of the stones that they uh, blasted out of there now form streets all over the world, which is a, a trivial yeah, well, that, thing. That was, a, that was a crazy right. detail because right. so, they, so they illegally blasted and, and yeah, bla blasted well, out quarries Hill, and right. took down houses and did all these super destructive things. And then the result of that was rocks that then served as ballast for ballast ships, which ships. seems like a pretty low value use of it. Well, they used them for <laughs> different things, but some of it was used uh, in ships for ballast, and those ships would sail to places like Valparaiso or, or Liverpool. And then when they'd get there, they would use this uh, gray, wacky stone, you know, this sandstone that, that makes up Telegraph Hill, and they'd turn it into, you know, street paving. <laughs> in these other cities. But there's a, the street has an amazing history beyond that. It's um, uh, right at the top of that hill is where uh, not two of the greatest movies ever set in San Francisco are, are filmed there. Filmmakers have always been drawn to this place. So Vertigo, uh, you know, probably the greatest movie ever set in San Francisco. Midge's apartment is just up at Union and, and Montgomery, just uh, you know, right, right above there. And the great film, uh, Days of Wine and Roses, a profoundly uh, depressing, brilliant film about alcoholism. They live also in in an apartment up in that same place. And there's a, a now a forgotten film called uh, uh, the, the House on Telegraph Hill. And that's uh, that's also set up there. So, it, and it had a uh, you know this extraordinary character, and I won't go on because I could talk about Calhoun for hours. But I'll, I'll end after this. But it had an extraordinary character, my really one of my favorite characters in all of San Francisco history, named Doc Robinson. And he was not really a doctor. You could just sort of do anything, and you'd become a doctor. He was a, became a pharmacist, but he came to San Francisco and he made his first fortune by collecting eggs from the Farallon Islands and selling them to the 49ers because they didn't have eggs. And he'd go out to the Farallons and collect moor eggs, which are really good and tasty and huge. They did have one somewhat disturbing aspect, which was that their yolks were bright red, which took people a bit of time to get used to. But he made a lot of money. And then he became the city's first theatrical impresario. And he lived in that in the, one of the magnificent houses with a widow's walk on on uh, on top of uh, on Calhoun. And I, I just did a piece on Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo during their visits. And Diego Rivera also stayed on Calhoun. So it has it has a long theatrical history. There were hijinks there where theatrical people would party and and with, with the Booth Elder Booth Junius Booth, who was like the father or uncle of John Wilkes Booth, was a famous actor of the day, and they would party and feed their horses champagne out of a pail. Uh, it was you know wild times. And then there continued to be other parties there into well into the 20th century. So it's a it's a great street. And Paul's illustration. I don't know if we we have the book here. But this is the view from Calhoun Terraces uh, off to the east. And Paul did a really magnificent drawing of it. And it's, a, it, it's well worth a, a trip up to that street. You know, one of the, you mentioned the, uh, the Gray Brothers. And um, there's sort of two related points uh, that, that are a common theme, I think, in the book. And one, one seems to be like rogue businessmen or, <laughs> or kind of semi-corrupt, you know, right. uh, scoundrels, some kind who, who, who actually, nice who actually made, a, made right. a big difference in the city. And, and part of that being actually the, the physicality, as you talked about earlier, the physicality of the city and a lot of, um, uh, you know, chopping down of hills and right. cutting of things and, you know, things like that. And, and so that, that kind of transformative aspect of the city, th that seems to be a common theme. And I, I, I wonder how you see that, the common themes of that playing out today. So, Ooh. so do you see that as a, as a kind of a continuing theme of San Francisco? Mm. Scoundrels well, remaking the city? You know, I, I'm, that you inevitably one must consider the Salesforce Tower, which is the only, no, we don't, we don't destroy the natural environment. We now daylight creeks, we don't fill them in. We don't, uh, you know, fill in all of the marshlands. We've improved greatly. Most of our interventions in terms of the topography are positive now. So if you're gonna be critical, you're gonna be critical more of architecture and development. I actually, I think the architecture of the Salesforce Tower is not bad. I think it's an interesting shape. 
I just wish it wasn't so damn big. Um, it, to me, my issue with that is that it just, you can see it from two, it, it's okay when you're right near it. Then it's just this mind-blowing kind of New York-style skyscraper. But when you get far away, you see it everywhere. And it's just too much. You know, I don't want to be reminded when I'm in certain parts of the Moraine Headlands that San Francisco is there. It just feels like a big, huge, hubristic announcement of this is man's dominion over nature. And it's a bit too much. They shouldn't have allowed it to be that high. But that's my opinion. Uh, but you no, know, in general, you, I, you know, most of our interventions now are good. I mean, Chrissy Field, the new uh, Hyde Street Reservoir Park, um, the, the tunnel tops and the Presidio, and the list goes on and on. The city is uh, rolling in money, and it spent a lot of that, a lot of that money in really great civic amenities. So, um, you know, much much of that is just to be commended. And Paul, as a, as a as a visual artist, how do you how do you think about or perceive some of these kinds of transformations? Like, so are you still very drawn to the kind of historic? Uh, aspects of, of San Francisco buildings and architecture, do the contemporary things uh, inspire you as well in some way? Um, I'm not necessarily drawn to the historical only. Uh, you know, actually, I like the, the, the Salesforce Tower just fine. It doesn't bother me. I think what's interesting is San Francisco has a long history of hating everything new that goes up and then give it 10 years and then they put it on T-shirts and it becomes the icon <laughs> because, you know, Transamerica Pyramid went up, People were up in arms, uh, Koi Tower, people were going crazy. Now, like, it's, so, you know, you just sort of- Even the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> the, yeah, even the bridge. Right. right, so yeah. here, and then, you know, did people not drive across it if they didn't like right. it? No, they, um, and then it becomes a symbol. I don't know if Salesforce Tower will become a symbol necessarily, but uh, in terms of what I'm drawn to, no pun intended, is that I like how the, the, the overall cityscape changes. So, Newer architecture buildings may not be as inspiring to draw as what I call building portraits, but I like the way they changed the landscape. And that was something that even when we were doing the book or whenever I'm doing anything historical, I consider because I'm like, wait, I'm doing a drawing that is a contemporary cityscape when we're talking about a history. But that's, that's something that I think Gary and I walk really nicely because there's always this sense of looking back. Uh, and so the... Yeah, I, I like watching the, the cityscape change. I think it's important to, for a city to reflect how people live. Um, you know, I've, I've heard a lot, uh, people say in, in places where there's a lot of historic renovation, that it's, uh, it's good to live in the new and look at the old. <laughs> because the, you know, when you, the old places aren't as comfortable. They're not really built for our modern lives, but the, the new places are comfortable and that serves a good purpose. Do you, do you think, is there a, any, particular lessons you think we can draw, like looking back. So what lessons do we draw from looking back that can apply to looking forward? Mm. That's, a, that's a hard question, I, and I'll revert think, more to the history in a minute, but I want to talk about the contemporary situation. And yeah. How I, that. Well, I mean, certainly just taking the, the biggest possible picture of San Francisco's history, um, its resilience really is the first word that comes to mind. Um, city has been... It was born instantly in a kind of, a, you know, ex nihilo, big bang. You know, they called it the instant city. Uh, somebody said it was generated spontaneously out of the earth. Um, you know, it just appeared. And uh, that set in motion this almost sort of psychedelic pattern of the city's existence. And then it was completely erased in the greatest catastrophe ever to befall an American city. Um, and the, it's not that well known. People f focus a lot on the 1906 catastrophe, the earthquake and the fire, but the rebuilding of the city is a really epic story um, and underreported and underwritten about, and it's pretty inspiring. I mean, they started literally working on it when the, the, the ruins were still smoldering and rebuilt it in remarkable time with great civic unanimity of purpose and, and great civic pride. You know, there's that famous line, the damnedest fine ruins. You know, even then San Franciscans were so either insufferably smug or laudably proud of their <laughs> town that even the ruins were, uh, you know, were, uh, were, 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 were celebrated. So, and then, you know, they've been through so many 
uh, boom and bust cycles. We've been through uh, at least one with the dot-com boom and bust and uh, seen huge changes. And the city has, has always, uh, you know, we had the Western Edition debacle of, the, uh, of, of redevelopment. Unfortunately, that's not one where you can really say there was a completely happy ending there. But the, uh, you know, the city has constantly reinvented itself. And uh, so I, to me, that's a lesson that I take that, you know, it's uh, something that I think is applicable both to cities and to human beings. Mm -hmm. That, you know, it's, uh, there's a certain quality of, uh, whether you call it uh, a can-do attitude, a never-say-die attitude, that is fairly, you know, it goes back to the Argonauts who in certain ways, you know, this, this is, you know, a little bit of a stretch, but they were kind of like, there was sort of a Darwinian process, you know, with the people that made it to California. It was very hard to get here. So uh, at least at the beginning, uh, they were a pretty remarkable bunch of survivors just to get here, and that probably played into some of the ability and the, maybe the myth more played into the mythology and, and the, uh, the belief system that the city could come back. But uh, yeah, that's something that I look at when I look at the whole sweep of the city's history. Thanks. Um, the, so the, the book has, what, 15 or so chapters? 16. 16 yep. chapters, and, and uh, each kind of built around a, a place. And, and some of the particular things that, that you picked out um, are sort of obscure things within well-known areas of town. Um, you know, Telegraph Hill, Knob Hill, uh, uh, Land's End, you know, things like that. Um, and then there, there are some other things, and, and I'm sure some things that are in the book that are in much more obscure parts of town. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear about kind of your, your three favorite things that are somewhere outside of the kind of central area of the city that, that most people are most familiar with. Well, I'm going to kick this one over to Paul, and then I'll, I'll pick up on it. But um, Paul uh, had his studio at that time over on Potrero Avenue, and... Uh, and one day when we were doing the book, he goes, man, there's this building that's up on like Mariposa Street that sits on this enormous plateau of rock. And I was like, whoa, that sounds interesting. And, uh, you know, we drove up and looked at it. And uh, but Paul, why don't you talk about your experience of that amazing, that amazing building? Well, yeah, it's actually right. called the Rock House. Right. Uh, and I do, I like to walk a lot. So for me, I'm walking around, I'm looking at either the architecture or the light and shadow. And so Gary and I have this, this rule that we both have to agree on, on a site. So we, we sort of come to each other with a list and we try to do an A and B, you know. Um, but what's interesting is he'll, he'll come to me with, with something that's historically really interesting, but if I go out and scout it and it doesn't work for me for whatever reason, then it gets nixed and then vice versa. So. I'm often tossing strange sites to Gary and saying, hey, I want to draw this because it's cool. And Gary will be like, well, let me look at it. But the Rock House, and, and a lot of times, he'll uncover these really amazing historical facts about it. And I think what's, what's interesting there, it kind of goes back to my earlier comment about each changing each other's vision, is that we didn't get locked into, oh, we're going to tell the same stories about the same sites that everybody knows or everybody's told before. And, um, and the Rock House was one that you can see just a little bit from the freeway, but it's like just, what is it, Slovenian Hall? Is that what's right there? It's right, right, yeah, that's on the, uh, I guess, yeah, that's right, it's right near there. Yeah, it's like right. half a block away. So you right. can see that when you're heading into the city on, on the 101, but, um, and it's basically on, a, on kind of a cul-de-sac type of street. So, but it's one block off of Potrero, and you just walk up there, and, and it's like, oh, I haven't been to this part of town before. And uh, and I just I just stopped and I'm like here's this old building that's just <laughs> built into a giant rock. So it was really fun because in a way I might have drawn it for myself but not known what the history is and then I can introduce it to Gary and vice versa. And we've we've uncovered quite a few little gems for for each of us that have surprised us. Yeah, the, and that the, one of the things about that location and this is just one of these things where the topography is sort of destiny of this building. I call it in the book Potrero Hill West because basically it was part of Potrero Hill and the 101 when they put it in just cut that whole part of Potrero Hill away. So this this sort of orphaned part and that's why the streets don't go through Mariposa, San Bruno, 
these streets all dead end there, so this is kind of a little island up there. And it's, as far as I know, it rests on the biggest rock foundation of any building in San Francisco. So when Paul, uh, you know, uh, saw it and, you know, did a great drawing of it, Paul, you want to yeah. find that one? The, um, and it turned out, you know, it had, like so many buildings do, uh, the, you know, an, an extraordinary history. So it was really those kind of, those uh, moments where each of us will, would kick something out of our, interests and our wanderings to the other one and then it, it, that I would never have written about that that building I mean unless I happened to wander down that street which in t 10 more years maybe I would have yeah. but uh, you know it was just because of Paul's interest in it that uh, that opened it up and I did the same thing for Paul there's the rock house page 70 if anybody wants to but the uh, I did the same thing for Paul one day when we were driving around south of Market in this really grimy part of south of Market. And I said, hey, have you ever seen the earthquake subsidence streets? And he was like, no, what's that? And I, there's a street called Shipley um, that's, I think, between Folsom and Harrison, possibly between Howard and Folsom and 5th and 6th, I think. And basically, it's an, um, there's, there are a number of buildings last since the 1989 earthquake that are completely insane. They are, the, they're like John Malkovich, being John Malkovich, floor 13 and a half. There, there are ground floor windows that are half covered by the sidewalk. So it's like the building got punched and sank into the mud. It's like these punch drunk buildings that have sunk down. And it's, the reason is that that was all made land, as they used to call it, that was all marsh land. And in the 1906 <coughs> earthquake, all of that land subsided enormously, and it continued to subside. So these buildings, they aren't the original buildings from 1906, but they built them afterwards, but the land continued to subside. And then at certain points, the city graded the street, but it was too expensive to raise the buildings. So the buildings just got half covered up. So in a way, they are some of the few, it's not a direct evidence of the 1906 earthquake, but because there's almost, there's, with the exception of buildings that have like clinker bricks, burned bricks in a few places, there's almost no evidence of the earthquake, uh, the greatest catastrophe in the city's history. But these weird streets are, uh, then there's more than Shipley, there's a number of them, are kind of a place where you can see this cryptic, kind of eerie sense. And I talked to a young dude coming out years ago uh, and, you know, he said, yeah, my, my, this whole house is completely cattywampus. If you put a ball in the hallway, it, like, rolls to the side. So I, I don't think they meet code, but, the, uh, but they're pretty, but, and Paul was, Paul just loved that and did a great drawing, and he found the wires. If you guys know Paul's work, Paul is the master of wires <laughs> and of sort of urban, strange detritus and, you know, he always used to say, you know, he's, he's really good at finding like odd back ends of things and non-glamorous angles. Uh, I think he used to say, you know, if you see a whole bunch of people looking at something, you would go and draw whatever I'd, was I'd turn around and draw what's behind Or whatever they're right. taking a picture of, I'd draw what's behind them. And I just <laughs> love that. That's one of the reasons I think that Paul and I were like, destined to work together because I love vacant lots and strange underbellies of cities and just, you know, just peculiar aspects of cities. And, and, uh, and sometimes that's because they're old, but they don't necessarily have to be old. They just have to be something that you see in a really unusual way, which was going back to your question about COVID. You know, that was a jarring, it was a disori literally disorienting event. And I think that's what both of us try to do. Right? Paul, you know, uh, I t there's a great, great artist, John Maddos in North Beach. I was talking to him about Paul, and he goes, yeah, his work is, it's mysterious. Because even though he's got, he's an incredible draftsman, um, you know, world-class draftsman, but it's, but it's not photorealism. There's always something in there a little, little strange and off about it. <laughs> well, that, that's why something like Shipley Street right. is perfect, right? Because right. San Francisco is always, it's kind of no perfect straight lines. And to right. go back to your, like the idea of the contemporary buildings, they're almost a little too clean. Mm -hmm. They, you know, the, you put a ball in, it sits still in, in most right. of them. But, uh, you know, another thing about the, like, well, I guess in that way, the, the leaning tower is a fitting, a fitting uh, <laughs> right. yeah, addition well, a, to the right. skyline, right? Yeah, <laughs> right, the lean, yeah. Um, a little too on the nose, maybe, but, uh, 
the Shipley, like, the, you know, you're on that street and you you feel it. Like, you know that there's something kind of wrong with these buildings. And But unless you stop and really study it and realize, like, oh, well, why did they build that sort of half room? Or, um, and then, but knowing, knowing why it's that way is, like, it creates really clear insight and makes it easy to draw. It's like, oh, yeah, it's almost like I'm drawing a building that's underwater, partly, and that water is actually the street. And, right. uh, and so there's a, there's a visual insight, th you know, that to understand, oh, this is what, what I'm making. That, and, um, and yeah, I mean, I might have drawn it, but I would have just thought it was odd. Mm. Uh, and so there's, it, it turned my eye in a different way. Uh, but yeah, the San Francisco buildings, I mean, wood buildings are great because there's always something a little broken or a little, like, a little warped and, and that organicness makes for really fun to render. And I think it makes it more pleasing on the page as well than just overly straight lines. The, uh, a lot of the book, um, a lot of the history is sort of about transformation, right? About how the city's changed. The rich people used to live on Rincon Hill and they got the cable cars, then they all moved over to Knob Hill and, you know, be kind of big shifts like that um, in, the, in the kind of both the social geography and the physical geography of the city. And I'm, I'm wondering if there are parts of the city or neighborhoods or blocks even that you think of as like, that's an unchanging part of the city. Like what, what sort of stayed the same amid, amid all this constant? Well, oil? actually, I'm, to bring you in, uh, we've been doing a lot of walking in the Tenderloin. Mm. And so we've done, well, we've done one piece. We've got another coming up, uh, the Tenderloin, that's not in the book, but it's because we kept the series going. <laughs> but it, you've talked a lot about that, of how that historical nature has both, is like, is wonderful to preserve, but is also holding it back. Just thought I'd sort of yeah. throw the ball at that. Yeah, I mean, the Tenderloin is uh, still, without doubt, the most fascinating, not necessarily the most attractive or safe neighborhood in San Francisco, although it's, you know, not quite as dangerous as it is sometimes held to be, but it, it's certainly gritty as hell. But it's a remarkable neighborhood because uh, some of the same things that have actually led to a lot of the social problems there um, you know, basically that nonprofits control a whole lot of the real estate there. Um, much of that is for good because they are uh, able to, you know, maintain uh, these social services for the most vulnerable people in San Francisco. But it also means uh, that, of course, there's a lot of social pathologies and ills that go along with that. But the, from a point of view of preservation and weird unchangingness, uh, all of those sort of residential hotels and funky old, you know, rooming sort of, they're not quite rooming houses, but they're various types of, of hotels that are there are essentially unchanged um, from when they were built, almost all of them uh, in the years of at, from the 1920s into the 1930s, right down to their blade signs. Their blade signs are still there. So wandering around the Tenderloin is this extraordinary a uh, feeling that you're kind of in this time capsule of the, you know, of, of a certain part of the city that actually once was the sort of blood, heart, and sinew of San Francisco. It's where working men and women, and women that had just joined the workforce, uh, women couldn't uh, make enough to live in apartments by themselves until stenography and typewriters came on and social changes you know, made it possible for young women to live in apartment buildings. And they, and then all the you know, combination of whether it was you know, uh, uh, sailors and, sh and warehousemen and longshoremen and clerks and policemen and all of the working people of San Francisco lived in those blocks. Uh, all the way up to Pine Street, but all the way down to Turk and Street, and it was, uh, you know, a, a, this kind of middle-class neighborhood, and the, that, that some sense of that, uh, when it was a vibrant, uh, very bustling, kind of very urban, deeply, or the most deeply urban part of the city, um, it's still there. And uh, so, you know, obviously, I'm sure everyone has kind of mixed feelings about that, because it's, you know, there's a lot of problems, really very serious problems in the Tenderloin, but it's also this kind of miraculously unchanged place. But uh, in another neighborhood, sort of not quite as, not quite as extreme, uh, the neighborhood I live in is probably 
just from the point of view of the, uh, the dinosaur-like people like me still hanging out in coffee houses and bars, <laughs> North Beach is probably the most recalcitrant to change. I mean, there's plenty of young, young folks living there and plenty of people that work in the tech industry have moved in there and it's like, you know, that's universal in San Francisco. But it's, I was doing some research a few years ago and discovered that, yes, those are, that's the oldest neighborhood in San Francisco. <laughs> they, they're, and you can see it, you know, it's like, right near where they discovered the Colombian mammoth bones uh, under the Pansini building across from City Lights books are bars where there are the human equivalent of those dinosaurs. <laughs> and, and they've been nursing that same drink for at least 40 years. So uh, I, I sort of love that, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, a, uh, it's definitely the, uh, a holdout uh, more than most neighborhoods. Um, but of course they all become like that, you know, I mean, People move to San Francisco and there's churn, but a lot of people stay. And you know, gradually you can see folks in the mission too. You can see you know, people that have been in Bernal Heights now. They may, maybe 30 years ago they were angrily accused of being arrivistes. At what point do you, I mean to me I hate all that because it's like when nobody gets to have like the I was the original person here and everyone after me pulling up the gangplank. It doesn't work that way. Um, but, you know, there's a tendency for old San Franciscans to wag their finger at anybody who arrived at some unspecified time that irritates them. <laughs> and, uh, after, after they arrived. <laughs> right. right. Well, you, you know, there is, there is always, and that's a product of this kind of uh, constant tension in any context between sort of the benefits of change and the benefits of right. keeping things the same, basically. And, right. and um, do you think the city has, has that balance right at the moment? I mean, you know, North Beach is the fact that it's sort of very similar is partly a product of mm -hmm. policies that yeah. have prevented it from changing. Yeah. Um, other neighborhoods, mm -hmm. it's different, but you know that's one of the fundamental issues really for the city, like how much change is, is good and how much is too much. Um, I mean, it's really a political question, not a, <laughs> not right. a literary question, yeah. but I'm, right. you know, as yeah. people who think a lot about the right. geography of the city, I'm curious what you think about that. Well, you asked, is there a balance, the right balance? Um, I can't answer that because it's my perspective. Uh, also, one thing I think it's really important is it's not just the city that's changing. It's that, you know, I've lived here 28 years and I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago or 10 years before that. My perspective on the city, what I do, uh, where I go, where I live in within the city changes. And if I think the... If we assume that our perspective is always the same, then of course we're going to judge, oh, it's changing. Well, you've got to change with it, right? Um, and so maybe the question is better, are you growing, how are you growing in relation to how the city's growing? And then it becomes, do you like it? I, you know, you, you were saying that uh, th it was an instant city and there's this boom and bust. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about the place for good or ill is that it will, you know, it's like it's like a party's raging and then a party's crashing and then a party's raging and uh, and sometimes you know you're having a good time and sometimes you're having a bad night, right? Um, but it's as long as that spirit stays alive, I think that's that is ultimately good. It might not always be the place for me or for you or for you know for anyone, and maybe that's okay too. And say you know it's time to go home from the party or go somewhere else. And uh, and when when we when we like dig our heels in and say, well, this is the place I wanted it to be 30 years ago or 40 or whatever, that's not really sort of accepting the vibrancy of, of growth and allowing, allowing like so many other places I feel like we, San Franciscan, people who live here left the places because they said, oh, it never changes. And then they come here and they're like, oh, it's always changing. <laughs> like, you know, be happy with one or the other. Uh, that's, that's my opinion on it. Yeah, and I, I just feel like if you, live in a city and you want things to be frozen in amber, you are destined for frustration and disappointment. I mean, cities are heartlessly changing and um, they're like, you know, pieces of the universe floating down the river of time. And you can't really, if, if you want to keep them the way you, you had it in your imagination, you're destined to be frustrated. That doesn't mean that every, you know there aren't policy decisions, zoning decisions, housing decisions that affect the nature of the city. I tend to be 
more on the build more housing side. I mean, this is a very controversial issue. It, it splits the left, and there's some strong arguments on both sides. Um, the strongest argument against building more housing that's put up by people on the left is that the laws of the market simply don't apply to a city as expensive as this and as sought after as this. Uh, so that you can build and build and build and build, but you won't achieve organically affordable housing, by which I mean housing that isn't subsidized by some entity, um, but where people just buy it at market rate, which is obviously the most desirable type of affordable housing. And that's a really tough question, because if this is, this place got discovered, you know, 20, 30 years ago, and not just by young people working in technology and other sectors. It got discovered by European money. It got discovered by Asian money. Their money capital can move all over the world at the, at the push of a finger now. So this is like people, there's only five places in the world that have a Mediterranean climate. This is one of them. There's only, you know, so many cities that are on an enormous world-class estuary like this. There's only so many places that have two world-class universities within 25 miles. There's just, the list goes on and on with the rich history, uh, with, uh, you know, a certain type of diversity. It's a, it's a limited diversity, unfortunately, because, you know, we've lost so much of our black population, but it is still a pretty diverse city in certain ways. So there's all these wonderful things about it, and, you know, people know that. And so that's gonna, it's going, in a way, this is like a gigantic version of Carmel or Santa Fe. And we just have to accept that. That's, and there isn't any magic wand that's going to make this affordable. If there's, and it's all held together with these Rube Goldberg-like contraptions like rent control, which are deeply flawed and deeply unfair, and they're like a lottery and a golden ticket. You know, I know people that have been living in like, you know, 1,700 square foot apartments. They're paying $1,100, and, and they're not means tested. You know, it's, it's just the luck of the draw, but that's how it is, you know, and everybody falls on, everybody rents, which I do now, um, is falls somewhere on that lottery. <laughs> um, it's not a perfect system, and, uh, and, but I, in general, still subscribe to the Yimby school more, that we need to build more, and that even if you only move the needle a little bit on market rate housing, that's a good thing. And, uh, and then obviously you have to just I answer the questions of if you're overcrowding this 46 square mile peninsula, but um, I don't think we're there yet. I would, I'd, up, I'd up zone a whole lot of the city, mm -hmm. um, you know, a whole lot of the western part <coughs> of the city. And if, especially if you have good architecture, European cities are like that. They're all six and eight story buildings. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, to me, that's, I lean that way, but I know a lot of people don't agree with that. Oh, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, so we have a few minutes for questions, if um, folks have questions, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so excited to read this book and listen to it today. Uh, one of the things that really caught me when I was drafting the draft of this book was the fact that Charles Henry Fay drew us through the back of the uh, Madison Avenue Courthouse and the Washington Trail, and then the kind of piece of commercial culture and extravagance that occurred during that week, 10,000 years before white people ever arrived. Right. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, that is a feature of this book that goes forward to you. And Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Um, I appreciate that compliment. Um, yeah, there, there are th this book, uh, I tried to do some, you know, throw ev a little bit of everything into, this book is kind of deeper dives into 16 specific sites. Uh, cool Gray City is 49 sites, but the historical uh, context is, is greater and the background's greater as opposed to really looking at each of these sites, which we do more in this book. But yeah, um, you know, for example, when I'm talking about um, the, uh, the Palace of Fine Arts, which Paul did a fantastic drawing for, um, that stood right near an old forgotten spit of land that was once called Strawberry Island. And there's reason to believe that the Yalamu, or the Ramatush, the, uh, the, uh, the first historical native peoples living in San Francisco after the Paleo-Indians, uh, probably picked strawberries there. 
So there's these wonderful little images that you know you just come upon, and we don't know this for a fact, but we do know that there was an Indian uh, food processing place, as they call it. It was an Indian camp, basically right near the sports basement at Chrissy Field. So yeah, I mean, you, I, so how I come upon these, it's just you know good old-fashioned research. It's like you know uh, reading a lot of books and following the footnotes and reading a lot of academic journals or. In the case of the, the, I made this joking reference to the Colombian mammoths that were found in North Beach. Um, yeah, I saw some reference to that, and I looked up the uh, Journal of Paleontology in 1981, and there's an argument, there's an article about how these three Colombian mammoths were unearthed in this weird way under this ugly yellow brick building in the heart of North Beach. So it's just, it's wonderful fun to kind of you know, just have this scatter shot. Uh, approach of, d of pulling in information wherever you can, newspapers of the time, uh, academic books, popular books, uh, you, and then, then bringing that all together with the experience of walking the city and seeing it and, and, and delighting in its visuals, which is why it was so much fun to work with, with Paul on this latest book. Other questions? <clears throat> Yeah. I just want to say that, you know, just going through that book, it just it makes me think of the image of just like like living through the pandemic in a way. Because you're seeing like there's this um, image of the rain washing away the city and it's just kind of like this like kind of very deep feeling. And it's just like seeing the image of and like the history of the like, you know, and like it's just like visually as an artist as well, it's just uh, invigorating. It is like very magical. And I guess the question was uh, thank you, and I don't know. I mean, we continue doing the monthly series. Uh, we're both, we both have multiple other projects going on. So uh, it's, it, I think it keeps us both working and uh, it sort of opens up little boxes, I know for me and I think for you too, of okay, we're gonna do this site and then that leads to something else and then uh, eventually, <laughs> I, yeah, there's no plan for a second one at the moment. Other questions? Hmm? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the origin story. The origin so myth. Right. Actually, um, we hadn't met in person, but I got an email from Bloomsbury. No, we had met briefly. Oh, did we? We before, met briefly before, before the Bloomsbury thing. Really? Yeah. I don't remember. Where did it we at, meet? It was at a gallery opening. Of they don't remember how they met. <laughs> oh, you know, on gallery, yeah, gallery openings. No, they, they, we, we got think. into this kind of intense conversation, and we sort of said, oh, yeah, maybe we'll work together someday. No, that was, was after. Was it? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're blowing our creation. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> you guys got to work this story a little I, better. Well, you know? so I got an email from <laughs> Bloomsbury right. for Cool Gray City. Go ahead. Um, but they wouldn't tell me the title. I had to sign an NDA or whatever. And uh, so they send me this book, and I start reading. I'm like, this is fantastic. Great. And the subtitle is 49 Views of San Francisco, so I assume you want 49 drawings. Um, how much time do I have? And I think they said six weeks. And I was like, I can't even scout 49 sites. And at the time, I was still I was publishing into Chronicle, and I was working on a novel. So I was like doing a weekly series, and I had a book to work on. And there was just no way I could do it. So I had to turn it down, um, which is just the nature of the beast. And I, I guess, and you can answer this, the, the wanting to have images was sort of a, a secondary, like you guys didn't know that while you were working on the book. Right. So um, I actually introduced you to John Adams who did the, the spot drawings for you. But then I met you, you won an award, the California Book Award for Cool Gray City. And I had simultaneously won a, a California Book Award for Everything's Its Own Reward. And we met that night. And I sent you an email. And I said, hey, I'm really sorry. I don't, I'm not, you know, turning down your book because I don't like it. Uh, because, you know, that happens. You know, everything's done by email. And then right. somebody that says they don't want to work with you. And you go like, oh, well, I thought I was good. <laughs> like, what's wrong? Like, these people in my community. Um, so then we met at, in my memory, we met at the California Book Awards. And we had a handshake. And we're like, someday we're going to find the project that is right for us. And then it was maybe, I'd say, five years later, four years or later? Even more. Maybe, maybe more. Six or seven years. Um, yeah, right. and uh, I had started a series in the Knob Hill Gazette 
and uh, and it just it I didn't it wasn't working for me I'd, sort of how I designed it. So I decided to retool, and I called up Gary, and I was like, "Hey, we can rebuild this thing from start. Why don't we do Why don't we do a series together with the idea of building it?" And and it just sort of like was an immediate click. We sat down, we had coffee, and I think by the end of the first coffee, we had figured out we were going to make a book out of it too. And we decided, well, you know, when you're publishing monthly, it's just a great way to just like keep a rhythm going. And then next thing you know, a year later, you've got the, the basics for a book. We even planned, I think, the week to pitch uh, <laughs> and, uh, and just sort of set it all up and just worked really methodically and really easily. I mean, it's funny, while we were talking, I was thinking, wow, we really like just found the rhythm that sort of, you know, the short, you, you writing the short pieces and, and the one drawing and how they went together. I don't think we really had any stumbling. They just sort of fell mm -hmm. into place really quickly. No, and I remember that I went over to Paul's studio and he had up on an easel this enormous original drawing that's in the book of Lombard Street. You want to show that one? Oh, yeah. The, yeah, the, the like crookedest like street in the world. It's like three by four feet. Yeah, and I just remember looking at that and it's an insane image. It's like an ant on acid perspective. <laughs> it's like, no, that's oh, not how well, that's a <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's such a, uh, you, you know, you've seen this, this a million times, Page 61 of and this is not the, the way the human eye sees this street. <laughs> it's the way Paul Madonna's eye sees this street. And it was, I was so blown away by that. And I already knew his work, but it was kind of like that sealed the deal. <laughs> it was like, you know, we're going we're gonna to have a lot of fun uh, doing this uh, together. And yet it, it unfolded with like, with even more precision than Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Well, that's <laughs> not right. really no, right. right. Well, that's, no, that's no, probably no, not a great no, note no, to no, end no, on, but um, <laughs> too soon. We, we do. <laughs> that was a very dark joke. But the, uh, no, it did. We, it, we, it, un, un, we do need like to, clockwork. we do right. kind of uh, right. need to wrap yeah. up, unfortunately, but... Yeah. Um, did you have a last? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't no, want to no, interrupt that was, your that last thought. It was just a delight. Yeah. It was a, it was a delight from the beginning, and it continues to be. So mm -hmm. it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to add one last thing, which is when he came up and looked at that drawing. The first thing he did is he pointed to one of the houses that are on the side and just started telling me a story about it. <laughs> and I thought, perfect. This is that. That's the marriage. We've got it right there. Right. Right. That's awesome. Well, thank you very much, and uh, as, I, as I said, I really enjoyed the book, and you know, as a journalist, uh, one of the things I love about being a journalist is you get to learn all kinds of arcana, obscure things. My head is filled with useless facts of many, many kinds, and I thought I knew a lot about the history of San Francisco, but I learned a lot from the book, and I guarantee you that if you read that book, you will, uh, you will take away uh, some fascinating things that you did not know about our great city, so uh, thank, thank you very much.